Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, we're getting into a complex here. If we open up a little bit, there's some apartment buildings. There uh, appears to be um, some office space here and a dead end. Now, the helicopter overhead is going to be radioing in to the patrol cars in this area. And they may be able to get into a situation where they can uh, try and figure out exactly where he's at and maybe take him into custody. Now, it looks like he's going through a courtyard right here. Uh, that's an interesting shot. Fortunately, there's nobody there. It's almost if he knows this area. I don't know why you'd pull through an area like that knowing it comes out to another street if you haven't been here before. Uh, but certainly he's slowed down quite a bit. Looks like he's looking around and maybe, just maybe, uh, thinking about taking a run for it. Uh, yeah, you were partially blocked there. Uh, there's the helicopter. Yeah, they won't. Uh, sorry, Philip, you were partially blocked with your question, but um, they won't pull the helicopter off. I, I would doubt that. But we certainly see a change in demeanor. You know, we had 130 miles an hour on the 60 freeway. There he sort of takes off a little bit down this uh, little surface street uh, here in the Whittier area, and uh, the helicopter overhead's not going to back off. They're going to stay on him. There's no reason they wouldn't. Uh, certainly, he's still a danger to the public, especially on surface streets like this. Go ahead and push in with the camera if you would a little bit. Um, on And do you see the high rates of speed now? Bring up our real-time speed tracker. But we could see him just take off all of a sudden. And, you know, you could have kids out here. I mean, certainly this could end up uh, into a deadly accident. There's no question about that. And there is a real risk. But it's interesting that he's staying in this neighborhood, slowing down, looking around, then accelerating. Must know the helicopter's overhead, uh, but no p patrol cars behind him. Yeah. Can accelerate. Yep. Yeah, there's no question about that. And he's uh, putting his life in danger, that's for sure. You know, one one turn from one of these cars when he's doing 95 miles an hour on a surface street, if they don't see him, uh, you know, even hitting a big pothole, I don't know if you ride a motorcycle or if you have much, but when you get up to those speeds, boy, I tell you, it gets extremely dangerous. Um, at this street here is a pretty major as we travel northbound on Lark Ellen Avenue. Um, it looks like there's some uh, stoplights up ahead, but nothing in the way of traffic. And boy, look at the acceleration, though. You can tell these motorcycles, these modern day motorcycles are so fast. I mean, they go up to 180 miles an hour in some cases, some even faster but the way they accelerate is incredible. Now he's at a stop light here, and I'm sure he'll look both ways before he goes through. So, you know, sometimes, Philip, we follow people that are being pursued, and we think there might be drugs or alcohol involved. This guy, not that case. He has control of that bike. He's driven it, uh, ridden it very well from the moment we got overhead. And he's still looking around. There are no patrol cars behind him. We don't think any authorities are following him at this point um, on the surface streets, just from the air. Yep. Okay, he's got the steering stabilizer turned up, if you know what I'm talking about, uh, because he doesn't want to go at those rates of speeds and hit anything that's going to make that front wheel wobble. Uh, but at this point, you know, law enforcement, I think, uh, from following this, are just saying, hey, let's follow him from the helicopter. We can't really control what this guy does on the ground right now, and we really aren't in a position to try and stop this. I don't see that there's much that they could do. 
um, to try and get in this guy's way. They're not going to be throw, be able to throw out a spike strip. That doesn't seem to be an option. CHP has called off their pursuit. It was on the freeways for a while. I believe this is going to be the uh, uh, West Covina area. And uh, it's it's uh, incredible, though, to watch these things accelerate, isn't it? At one moment, uh, it looks like, bring up a real-time uh, speed tracker. He'll be doing 35 or 40, and with an instant, he'll be up to 90 miles an hour. Yeah. Yeah, the <coughs> push into the bike. Now, this is a dead end right here, Philip. I, I want to interrupt you for a moment. Open up out of the shot. Oh, he realized it, and he turned around. Uh, that was a dead end on that street. So that's a situation where if patrol cars were behind him, they could have ended it uh, as he went down that little surface street, and it was a, a cul-de-sac. There was no place else to go. Uh, so certainly we, we talk a little bit about him maybe being in an area that he's familiar with. This probably isn't the case here. He waving? <laughs> I think he might be. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be the first motorcycle chase that I've covered where the motorcyclist did it on purpose and was trying to get a little attention, was waving at the police. Uh, and that appeared that uh, that's what it was in that uh, situation right there moments ago that uh, he was just waving at the helicopter overhead because there are no patrol cars behind him. And I can't tell what type of motorcycle that is. Uh, it looks like a late model, and uh, you know the the power to weight ratio on these things. Some of them up to 200 horsepower, and they only weigh like 400 pounds. It just makes for a rocket out on the roadways. Uh, we haven't seen. There's a patrol car at that intersection. Let's see if he turns. He does. Uh, so uh, it looks like now, if we open up a little bit, you're going to see the patrol car behind him. Uh, and we'll see if he, boy, he does go back on the motorcycle and push in. So as soon as he saw that motorcycle behind him, he really started the acceleration. This is, this is accurate, 75, 80, 90 miles an hour. For a moment there, it took a second for the speed tracker to catch up. That wasn't 140. Uh, and now he's slowing a bit for this intersection. There's a patrol car behind him, and that has changed his demeanor here. That's, uh, he's going to go through this intersection, make a right turn. There's another patrol car. So it looks like we're in a jurisdiction now. Uh, and I believe we're still in Whittier, if I'm not mistaken. Excuse me, not Whittier, in uh, the West Covina area. And um, they do have two patrol cars behind them at the moment. Thank you. Uh, that's correct. They tried to pull him over for speeding. We're actually in Baldwin Park, and I believe those are Baldwin Park PD units behind him. Uh, but they just cannot pursue this motorcycle on the surface streets. You know, the officers have to stop for the red lights. They can't just bust through. Uh, and the motorcyclist was able to maneuver through those lights very quickly. Um, they're still behind him. You don't see him in this shot because they're too far off. We'll stay on the motorcycle at this point. Uh, but we're in Baldwin Park. We're headed back southbound towards the 60. And even though they have a couple of units behind him, uh, it's really difficult for them to try and track him on the ground.
I, I can't really tell. There's really, the patrol car is behind him a couple hundred yards. They're just having a hard time keeping up. It looks like they'd like to get right on his tail, but uh, at this point, um, he's just too maneuverable for them. And the acceleration on that bike is such that the patrol cars get caught behind a red light as they have now. And then he just slows down almost, Philip, as if he's taunting them. He, when he sees the, the patrol cars go through the red light, you don't see this as well as I do, um, he accelerates. And then when they get stuck behind a red light, well, he slows down and he waits for them to catch up. So it's almost like a cat and mouse game here. Open up a little bit so you can see the uh, patrol cars behind them now and see how close they've gotten. Now look at that. That's what you know really frightens you, I would think, if you're the motorcycle. If somebody pulls in front of you, you hit them, and it could be all over very quickly. Crossing right underneath the 60 freeway now, headed southbound. And um, you can tell he waits for those car, the patrol cars to get on him and then he just launches and takes off. So it almost appears that this is a bit of a game to this motorcyclist. Yeah. I think we're up to about 100. Yeah, yeah, I tell you, no doubt about that. And uh, if this is one of the wins, bring up the speed. Would you were right on top? It should be accurate. And he is really moving now, 90 miles an hour. And look at that, in and out of traffic. So exactly right, Philip. I mean, although the public at large is in a bit of danger here, uh, as far as if he crashes into a car or, God forbid, hits a pedestrian, because that could be fatal. Uh, if he crashes at these speeds, he's really going to be in trouble. Give me the other side, it'd be great. No, no, absolutely, and the patrol car swerving in and out, almost like, yeah, um, I'm not certain when you lost our signal, but um, yeah, they're no longer behind him was the point I was making, and he was swerving in and out, almost like he's just enjoying riding his motorcycle. Uh, he certainly seems to have complete control of the bike, and we are still, um, we're in the Hacienda Heights area now, we're south of the... Uh, 60 freeway no longer on the north side um, and we did see him go into what it was almost like a business park there go into the courtyard and i saw a big parking structure and i thought possibly we've seen that before that he might try and make a move there and uh you know make a run for it knowing that there was no patrol cars behind it but he does know the helicopters overhead and once again at this point uh, i think they're just going to be content to follow with the helicopter you see him in that shot and just wait until uh, the suspect finally decides to uh, you know, make a run for it or give himself up. Well, fortunately, the Sheriff's Department has a lot of helicopters. I'm not certain how many, but dozens. And what they'll do is uh, when one helicopter will say, you know, down to uh, WAG-8, in this case down to Long Beach, and just tell them, hey, I got 40 minutes worth of fuel left, and they'll send another helicopter up here to take over. They'll do a swap out. One helicopter will tell the other one, hey, I've got him in sight. 
the main helicopter overhead will leave and uh, the secondary ship will come in and you know they could keep doing that all day so that wouldn't be an issue um it's it's in the sheriff's area right now so they're the ones overhead if it came into la's uh you know towards downtown went west it's possible that uh, lapd would take over it, it it changes from time to time but you know air support won't be an issue boy going into a parking lot here now this is interesting because we have patrol cars that did catch up with him when he stopped driving uh so quickly and now we're in a parking lot with a shopping center a strip mall if you will and you have patrol cars moving into this area, he could be locked in. If he goes behind there, if he makes a right turn, they do have the opportunity to possibly uh, get him um, cornered in this shopping center. Uh, yeah, now there, there's one behind. If they get one on the other side, then they may be able to pin him behind this supermarket or this large strip mall. Uh, it's unclear if they have the resources to do that. So that's sort of what happens, Philip. It's sort of a trade-off. There's a patrol car. Uh, it's a bit of a trade-off. And boy, look, he sees the uh, officer there. He's not going to stop, and he's just going to take off. That gives you an idea of what I was saying. Yeah, definitely. But it's just so difficult for them to try and stop this with the patrol units. I mean, no matter where he goes, the bike is so maneuverable and so quick that it, it's nearly impossible to stop this. Yeah. And now they they've decided to give up. I mean, I, I think what they saw was um, there's no way that two or three patrol cars are going to stop this guy on the ground. Um, they would need uh, a lot more resources than that uh, because he just toyed with them. I mean, once they came around, he saw him. He just maneuvered through the parking lot and took off. So I, I think they realize that uh, there's little to no chance they're going to stop this on the ground. Uh, it's a trade-off, right? If you have enough patrol cars behind him, you may be able to take him into custody when he does something like that. Uh, but getting them in position is difficult. And it's dangerous because you're traveling at such a high rate of speed. And at this point, I think they're going to be content to just follow this from overhead. You know, as you go into different jurisdictions, you know, you get into Baldwin Park, their police officers may look at this a little different. They want to get them off their surface streets. Uh, so it can change just depending on the jurisdiction that you're in. Uh, but Sheriff's helicopter is staying overhead. Coming up on an intersection here, uh, a red light. But you can see how maneuverable the bike is, how he can go right to the front of the line. He can look to see if he wants to run this red light. It looks clear to him. There's traffic. He sees that he can get by safely. And, you know, how do you follow along in a patrol car in a situation like that? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I think, Philip, this thing is going to continue on until the motorcycle just decides to stop. Um, you know, there's, there's not much that they can do. And uh, he's putting himself at risk, as you mentioned. Um, I mean, I have a bike. I, I don't ride anymore because it's so dangerous. Uh, but I used to all the time. And, uh, boy, my son wanted to ride. And I'm like, no, you can't. <laughs> uh, because it, it, so many things happen out on the freeways when you're a motorcyclist and on the roadways you just have no control over. And even though this guy has real good control of this bike, he's able to maneuver it very well, it's extremely dangerous. Now, here we go. They have changed something here. Uh, up ahead in this intersection, there is a patrol car. I'm not sure uh, which agency it is, um, but uh, you're going to see the motorcycle come up 
to this intersection and you're going to see the patrol car right there. So it'll be interesting to see exactly how they handle this. It looks like an LA County Sheriff patrol car and they did force him to head that direction, but you know, he doesn't look like he's too worried about it. It almost looks like he's looking back saying, come on, catch me if you can. Um, uh, no, and I wouldn't think so. No, I, I've never seen that. I mean, more than likely if you did it, you may injure or maybe even kill trip either, although that wouldn't be a possibility on with a bike or anyone. Look at the speeds, Philip. That's an accurate speed too, up to 117, now slowing down. It'll take a moment to kind of click down the way the sky map uh, works sometimes. You see that 137, it's not that. It went up to 100 and then it sort of uh, evened out and then it went back down. It'll give us a, an accurate uh, speed here in just a moment. It's, it's interesting the way the GPS acquires and, and does get on to uh, speeds of vehicles. But um, those are accurate there, we believe, around 70, 80 miles an hour. And the acceleration is still incredible. But, you know, th what that showed you moments ago was how difficult it is for law enforcement to try and control something like this, uh, to try and keep this uh, or to stop this. And it, it's nearly impossible. And I, I really think they're just going to follow this from the air uh, until this individual gives up, makes a run for it, you know, goes to a parking structure. Uh, goes into uh, you know an area where he can run and get into a house. I've seen that several times, uh, but I don't think they can stop it on the ground. No, you know, they won't, he won't lose the helicopter, but boy, look at how close that is and how fast that is and how close it is to the vehicles. One wrong move, one, I mean, and this, this guy could be, uh, he could be gone. He could be in an accident and kill himself and he could uh, tragically, we hope not, uh, injure someone else. But the speeds here have been excessive and what was really unusual is how he slowed down to let that patrol car get right on his tail, pointed back at the officer and then just launched in this bike. Uh, but the helicopter overhead will not lose him. We don't have weather conditions. You know, sometimes it's really foggy. We might have an issue. Uh, we're not in airspace that would restrict us from flying through this. And more than likely, they'll never be able to get at a speed higher than what the helicopter can travel. Even though it might go a little faster than the helicopter, the helicopter can go direct. And most streets don't go just absolutely in one direction. So you can kind of cut them off. Um, we have followed a couple of pursuits where the motorcycle was faster than us. We can go about 130 knots, 140 miles an hour, 142, 145. Somewhere in there would be our max speed. Um, but we've never seen one that really traveled at that rate of speed for such a long time that we couldn't at least keep them in our sights. Well, he was on the freeway when we first picked him up on the 605 North, and he got off on Vincent, I believe, on the 10. We followed him on the freeway for a while. He did cross back over the 10, had an opportunity to get back on the freeway, and then decided not to. Um, we're, like, right in between the 10 and the 60 right now, um, and you can see the motorcycle has slowed considerably, looking around, now turning around, going back in the opposite direction. I don't see any patrol cars behind him, and so... Um, it, it's difficult to uh, even what he's thinking. He's taking his shirt off or his jacket or backpack or something and threw it there. Yeah, there's nobody behind him, though. I don't see any patrol cars behind him. So uh, he's, he's acting a little unusual now. Um, 
I've seen this a little bit, but uh, right now it's just the helicopters overhead radioing his position. Uh, they'll sort of see, I mean, they, they'd like to get this guy into custody. They, they don't want this type of thing to take place. It's a danger to himself. It's endangering the public. And so, you know, they'd like to make sure they get this guy in custody. So it doesn't happen again. You don't need uh, somebody like this getting away and then not thinking, well, I'm just going to do this, uh, you know, a couple times uh, during the week. Uh, we're into a, a shopping center here, and there are patrol cars not too far away. They just can't keep up with them. Um, but, boy, when the patrol cars did catch him, it was almost like cat and mouse and almost like he was saying, hey, you can't catch me. Uh, but there are no patrol cars coming into this strip mall right now, and at least the motorcycle slowed down, fortunately, because we do see a lot of pedestrians out here uh, in front of this market. The cul-de-sac, I, I don't see a pattern either. Uh, he he pulled, turned down this street. He's obviously not uh, familiar with the streets because that was a, a dead end that he just turned on to. He turned around. And, you know, that's, that's the um, dilemma you're up against if you're law enforcement. If you had five vehicles behind him, you might be able to put up a barrier here and stop this. On the other hand, you're putting the officers at risk. And at the other hand, every time they got behind him, he was driving more radically and at higher rates of speed. So I think they're content to just follow from the air. He went into this neighborhood, made a turn down what was a dead end, and then came right back onto the same street uh, that he was on before. So I don't see a pattern. It's almost uh, as if he's turning around looking to see if the patrol cars are behind him so they can play with him a little more. Uh, it's unreasonable to assume they could do that because there, there are patrol cars in the general vicinity, but they're not close enough to get in there that quickly uh, to try and stop him uh, in a situation like that. But, you know, now he's turning around again. He's uh, headed back to the west on Francisquito Avenue. And now he looks like, oh, he's turning into a sidewalk. We haven't seen this before. So, um, oh boy, I wonder if he knows those people. Yeah, that, that's unfortunate when we see these things. You know, if they go on long enough with social media the way it is compared to what we, we dealt with when we followed these, uh, you know, 25 or 30 years ago, um, now people start to realize it's happening, and sometimes it just uh, embrazens the person being uh, pursued, and they get out and they just try and get more and more attention, and it really just becomes more and more dangerous as time goes on. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> yep, I'm waving again. Yeah. 
Yeah, and Philip, we did get some information that uh, the um, Sheriff's Department did get the backpack. They went through it, and there was nothing identifiable inside that backpack. So as you mentioned, some of the things he was shedding could lead them to a description of, or at least uh, lead them to the identity of uh, the suspect, but that was not the case with the backpack. So, um, so far, this guy has not done anything um, to let authorities know who he may be. Um, now, this is interesting. Stopping in a gas station, talking to someone. Now, we haven't seen him on He could actually be talking to people and heading to this location to meet someone, although it's possible, you know, they have those helmets that have, oh, but look, is he going to get into that vehicle? Oh, he's stealing the gas. Look at that. He, he rode up to that and just got enough so that he could drive on. It didn't look like he took much on, but those motorcycles do not. Boy, look at that. I'm sure that person was frightened, too, as they pulled up. I'm assuming they didn't know that individual. Could have. And he's waving at the sheriff's helicopter. Yep. But a gallon gives you a long way. Yeah, even a couple gallons, I mean, um, if that if that much, but that's going to get them a lot of miles. Um, you get pretty good miles per gallon if you're not heavy on the on the accelerator. Um, yeah, I can't tell how big the bike is. I can't tell if it's, you know, large CC, 1,000 CC. If it's, you know, some of these bikes, even the, the 750s or the 600s are just so quick these days. Um, but there was a patrol car that he went by on the roadway, and it was fairly close there. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, jurisdictions, um, then you start to get, uh, you know, different procedures um, with those agencies. And um, sometimes uh, one city that will say, hey, just let him go. Another city will may say, hey, let, let's uh, see if we can't stop this guy. So as we, uh, you know, he travels out through, uh, through the city in all these different areas, sometimes we'll see a different approach on the ground. Yep. Uh, the 10. Yeah, the, the West San Bernardino Freeway, not far from the 605. We're in Baldwin Park, and we did see speeds up to 130 miles an hour earlier on the freeway. We'll see if he starts to travel at that rate of speed. And then also, you know, CHP may engage. If he stays on the 10 westbound for a, a, a long stretch of time, uh, they may decide to get involved, but earlier they had just backed off. They, they weren't interested in trying to follow the motorcycle at those types of speeds. Uh, no, no doubt about that. He's got control of this bike. Uh, he's traveled very recklessly, very close to some vehicles, and he's fortunate that he hasn't been involved in an incident and got himself injured or killed. We're on the 605 northbound. I think you lost my signal around the 10 and the 605. So he, he got onto the 605 north. So now we're headed up, you know, up uh, towards the Irwindale area, headed through El Monte. Um, but we have seen some pretty high rates of speed 
on the freeway, you know, but he got some more gas. Maybe he was low on fuel, got himself a gallon or two, and that could keep him out on the roadways for, you know, hours. Uh, we did, uh, it was on the 60 West and then got on the 605. It started in the Norwalk area, um, came up through the Kalima Pass, for those folks familiar with that, up into Hacienda Heights, onto the 60 westbound to the 605 North to the West 10, then onto the surface streets for quite some time, then on back to the West 10, um, and then North 605. And uh, this will end, the 605 North ends up at the 210 uh, in the Irwindale area. And uh, there's not much traffic up here as far as the volume on the freeway is concerned. So he's got a, uh, you know, an open roadway up ahead, if you will, if he just wants to continue on. But uh, no CHP units behind the vehicle, just the sheriff's helicopter you see there overhead. Well, the sheriff's helicopters are on patrol, so they're usually pretty close by, which means that if they can follow the uh, suspect on the, the roadways, on the surface streets, for maybe just three or four or five minutes, and they can keep them in sight, and they can uh, radio the location to the helicopter, once the helicopter's overhead, there's not that many motorcycles out on the roadways. You've seen that. I think we haven't seen too many. And then you're looking for somebody driving at those rates of speed in the general vicinity. So it can be a little challenging, I think, at first for them to find them if they only have a, a general area to look in. But once they've got a pretty specific location from the ground units and the helicopter gets overhead once they have them, they're not going to lose them. Uh, the only time you lose them is, uh, you know, from a helicopter would be weather conditions or airspace restrictions like, you know, flying in front of uh, the extended center line at LAX or Burbank where they have scheduled flights. You just can't do that. Yeah. Yeah, and we do understand now that CHP says they are not going to pursue. So it's on the freeways, and, um, you know, I mean, from, from my perspective, I, I think that's a great policy. I, I don't know why they'd want to get patrol cars on this guy on the freeway and then just encourage him to drive back at those 130-mile-an-hour speeds. It just doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, he's got to come to a stop at some point, and the helicopter's overhead. We're making a decision. He looked like he was on the transition to the 210 freeway east, but he actually got on the transition road to the 210 westbound. So that's pretty indecisive. You know, last moment thinking, uh, I'm going to go 210 west, which makes us believe or makes me believe that, you know, the guy just doesn't really have a plan at this point. He's not headed to any place in particular. I mean, that's a long transition road. He knew well before that that he had a choice to make, and he made it at the last moment. Pretty close to that vehicle. We're now going to be on the 210 westbound. Uh, traveling, if you will, uh, through Monrovia towards the Arcadia Pasadena area. Wow, look at that. Could be.
Uh, well, we're off to 210. You got off on the Buena Vista in front of a Best Buy here, in front of the parking lot. You know, it's interesting. We had a report. Uh, we heard something uh, over the scanner saying the CHP would not pursue. And uh, then there were two patrol cars behind them for a moment. So not all that uh, information gets uh, to us correctly. They make changes we don't always know about. Uh, but they didn't follow him off of the freeway. So it may have been just a couple of patrol cars that were out. But um, he went through that shopping center there. It almost, Philip, it looks to me as if he's slowing, going into some areas, and actually, like I said earlier, playing a, a game of cat and mouse with the officers, looking to see if they're behind him, and then slowing down a bit till they get closer, and then taking off. Uh, but they're not playing that game at this point. They're not following him. And boy, look at that truck. He looked a little suspicious, like he was trying to get up along that motorcycle, that black uh, dually there. Uh, but obviously, that gives you an idea, if you wanted to do that, how difficult it is. You just can't really get on a motorcycle in a situation like this. Oh, there you go. Yep. And, yeah, yeah, well, he's in an area now that this is going to be probably Monrovia, if I'm not mistaken, uh, their jurisdiction. Um, and, you know, there'll be a lot of surface street patrol cars in this area. There's one behind him that you see right there. Uh, they're getting the information as to where he is. The longer he stays here, they've decided they're going to pursue this vehicle, uh, at least at this point in this jurisdiction. And the longer he stays in this area, the more situated they'll have the patrol cars in intersections. We also heard just moments ago, Philip, that um, this could be stolen. So they're assuming now maybe a stolen vehicle. And we are going to get back on the 210 freeway westbound now. Uh, this is a long surface street that could put them back on the 210 west or put them back into that same shopping center. But no, look at the acceleration there and uh, back on the 210 westbound uh, headed towards Arcadia and Pasadena. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. He's got con good control of the bike. We've never seen anything in the way that anything we've seen that would make us think that uh, this guy isn't an excellent rider. Uh, you know, his mental capacity, we certainly can question that, that's for sure. But his ability to ride the bike, um, he's certainly shown that he has, you know, mastery of that motorcycle. He's been able to swerve in and out of traffic, go into shopping centers, uh, slow down with one arm and ride his bike and wave at people, come up into a gas station real quick, get off the bike, fuel it back up, get back on board and take off. Uh, so they're, they're dealing with an individual who uh, unfortunately can ride this thing well. It gives you an idea, you look at our screen right there, um, it gives you an idea what we're dealing with. We're getting some moisture up here along the foothills and uh, we're gonna take that camera off for just a moment. Please bear with us. I wanna see if we can't clear the screen. Go ahead and just move the camera lens to the left and see if the wind doesn't uh, clear it off for a moment. And then we'll come right back on it and that may help us out a little bit as far as our picture is concerned. It's a little difficult. Heavy rain, it'll clear off. A drizzle like this when we're in the clouds, it makes it a little harder. Uh, that may have helped a bit, but it's getting difficult for us in these weather conditions to keep that clear. Not much. Yeah, I'm not seeing that, Philip. Not much of that. I can tell you it's going to be a problem for us here in a little bit because we have separation issues with the Sheriff's Department helicopter down below. And what that means is, you know, we're going to stay 1,000 feet from them and above them. That's uh, our, um, you know, agreement with the Sheriff's Department. And as I look ahead, you don't see it, but there's some low clouds over the Pasadena area. 
and it may mean that we have to back out a little bit, and then when you do get low visibility like this, sometimes it could be difficult for us to, to really stay right on it. Uh, we'll see what happens as we get up ahead, but uh, it looks like, you know, that uh, Eagle Rock area, we've got some pretty low clouds, but I haven't seen slick roadways, so it doesn't look like it's going to affect, you know, his ability to have grip with the bike on, on our freeways at this point. Yep. Yes, that's correct. Yep, got out of the way. Yeah, he's following behind. You know, he pulled over, he got into the, the fast lane, he was in the carpool lane, and then he got right back behind. But you know, we're, we're seeing speeds that are pretty um, even or close to the speed on the freeway. Uh, it's only a little bit faster. So we're, you know, we're looking at 67, 70, 75, about what the pattern uh, of the speeds are on the, on the 210. But the other motorcycle's keeping up with him, and he's right alongside him. They have three of them now. Yeah, you would hope the other, you would hope the other motorcycles had a little more sense than to take off and follow this guy. Um, you know, not all these guys out there are that crazy, and uh, most of them, you know, have their own uh, health concerns uh, at the foremost. And this guy, you know, he rides this thing well, but we've seen several situations where one turn of a car, one little incident, and uh, you know, this guy may not make it. He'd be in, in an accident at those types of speeds so vulnerable on a bike, um, you know, you can get seriously injured or killed real quickly. Is that? All right. Does that look like, whatever you can do. Does that look like there's no lights on that bike, like it's a race bike? Yeah, I mean, I didn't see any headlights. An hour, 45 to an hour. Oh, look up to take off. Hover, hover, just hover, just hover, just keep your heading and hover, right here, hold it, hold it, right here, perfect. Climb if you can, and go south. Interesting. All right, charge up. Got it. Where'd he go? Where is he? Go ahead, go this direction and just give me a left pedal turn, turn it and put it into a hover. 
I see him. Hold it right here. Perfect. Hold it right here. There you go. Now go forward. Push your nose over. I saw him. Let's go left a little bit. There's nobody out there. Come left for me. Yeah, I'm looking for him. Is that him? Okay. Stop it right here. I would climb if you can. Just get a little higher. Okay, hold it right here. Just give me a lift. Give me a hold it right here for a moment and climb. Go right up to this cloud layer. You're doing a great job, by the way. Okay, let's go straight ahead. Hold it right here. Now he went back that way. So just uh, pull it into a hover, make a right pedal turn. This is good. Let's go to the north a little bit. Just hold it right here, basically. You're good. Just hold it in a hover. Uh, you better go north so we're not right on top of the sheriff ship. Get, keep going north. You're clear out my window. Good job. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he did. You know, we've gone around in circles to just south of the 210 on the lake in Colorado here on Green Street now, uh, right in the heart of downtown Pasadena. Um, it's unclear Pasadena PD is going to get involved. There we go. We talked about this earlier. Went into a parking structure, and that's why you want to have units behind them if you want to take them into custody because uh, we're into a parking structure here with a helicopter overhead. Uh, he'll be radioing for the patrol units in Pasadena to head this direction. And we, all we can do is keep a wide shot and see if we see the suspect come out. But I've seen several of these pursuits with motorcycles and, and vehicles as well, where the suspect will finally go into a parking structure and then try and make a run for it on foot. And we'll just have to see exactly how this is going to unfold. There's one. Yep. Two, there's It's possible. I mean, he may have got out, and we didn't see him, uh, nor did the uh, sheriff's helicopter overhead. It, it, it's hard to say, but they're going to surround this parking structure now, and that's the trade-off that you have. If you're going to follow a suspect on a motorcycle uh, driving erratically at those rates of speed with patrol cars, you risk the officers and you risk the public. Um, but if you had them behind the motorcycle when he pulls into a parking structure, more than likely you could surround it quickly and take that individual into custody. So in my opinion, I think it's better to just let him go, especially, you know, we just heard that it's basically, at this point, just guilty of a misdemeanor. Um, you know, if it was a big truck traveling at those rates of speeds, then I think they'd have to do something to make sure they were uh, going to try and stop it. But at this point, if the suspect goes into this parking structure and makes a run for it, nobody gets hurt, then this uh, ends pretty well. It'll end uh, very well if they get him into custody, just to make sure he doesn't do something silly like this again. Go to the right. I'm not. Yeah, you know, Pasadena PD, this is their, their area. They'll be fair, uh, very familiar with the surroundings. You may not be able to get out on that side, Philip. So if you ride in, you may have to come back on to um, Green Street. I'm not certain about that, but I do know that, you know, the patrol cars who patrol this area are very familiar with it. They know the ingress and egress of these parking structures. That's what they do. Every day they're out on their patrol. They check these areas. So they're going to know if there's another way out. If there's not, then if he can't ride out, then basically he's only able to walk out. So they do want to surround it uh, at this point. And we didn't see him come back out from the parking structure. So we still believe that he's inside and the sheriff's helicopter's overhead just orbiting. 
Uh, it looks like they believe that he's inside. They did not see him come out either. It looks like we're hearing they're arresting somebody. Push in to the left on the street there. I believe they might be arresting someone. We did hear that. Um, we're going to try and drift a little bit so we can get into the front, but they may have just taken the suspect into custody. There he is, I believe. That's someone. I'm not certain if it's him or not, but it could be if he got rid of his um, sweater. All right. To climb a little bit if you can. I think we can go up a little another 50, 100 feet. Open up a little bit. Yep. Uh, yeah, they. Yeah, they did take him into custody fairly quickly after they surrounded the building, um, and it d did match the description that we had, as you mentioned, somewhat. I think more than anything, more than likely, that is the suspect. We don't know for sure yet, but the demeanor of the police right now is not uh, that they're trying to search for more individuals, from what I can tell. Go ahead and push in real quick uh, here right in front of the, um, the parking structure. Uh, you know, I don't see them rushing in. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they've already located the motorcycle. Um, you know, they can just reach their hand down onto the engine and see if it's hot so they can tell if it's a motorcycle just parked there or if it's the one they've been pursuing. They also have a pretty good description of it, so they'll, they'll know pretty quickly if it matches that. Um, and more than likely, that is the suspect. We don't know for certain, but I think as we follow these things, this went on for, what, an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes. Uh, fortunately, no one was hurt, um, and uh, we do hope that is the suspect because if it is, then we know that there's no more danger to um, anyone out on the street. Open up in a shot a little. Well, uh, uh, yeah, it's certainly possible, although the officers are still looking there at the parking structure. I'm not certain exactly why. Uh, they haven't dispersed, um, so possibly that is the suspect. Um, I'm not certain. We just don't have that information confirmed yet. Uh, we think it's very likely 
But, uh, boy, if you've uh, followed any of our pursuits or stories, you know, you can't go with what's likely. Um, you know, a lot of times fact is stranger than fiction, and uh, it's hard to say exactly what's going on. I don't see the patrol cars leaving, so they may still be trying to identify that that is the suspect, and maybe they're just going to clear the rest of the parking structure as a precaution. They're actually running there. Is that the bike there? Can we, is that, it might be the bike behind the tree. It looked like something, but uh, it's a little interesting that they haven't dispersed, that they haven't just left the scene. I'm not certain uh, if they do have confirmation that is the suspect. Uh, usually we see them uh, leave the scene a little quicker unless there's something that happened inside that parking structure we're unaware of. Uh, but now they're entering it, and they're not entering it like they know for certain they have the right guy in custody. Open up a little bit, see if they left the suspect out, the other one out. It's possible they detained that individual. I wanted to see if they were going to let him back out of the patrol car. Uh, they may have detained him quickly just so that they could make certain that uh, that's an individual they didn't have to deal with. Um, it, it's unclear, though, at this point from our assessment, what we see here at the scene, whether or not they know for certain that is the suspect. I want to come out to a little bit of a wider shot. It's on Green Street and Los Robles, just a little bit south of the 210 freeway, right in the heart of downtown Pasadena. It won't, for the most part, affect the drive here. Pretty good routes around this. I don't think uh, people who live in Pasadena have to worry about it. Um, obviously, if you live in Pasadena, you want to know the suspect is in custody, though, because um, obviously he's, he's willing to put himself at risk and the public at risk, and uh, it'd be nice to know that this is all over. We just haven't got that confirmation yet. And what we're seeing with officers standing at the entrance and exits with a group of officers just going into the parking structure moments ago, it leads me to believe that they're not certain that that individual they took into custody was the motorcyclist. Uh, they're still here. They still have the parking structure surrounded. And we do see, did see a group of officers going into the structure to try and clear it. All right. Uh, yep. Yeah. All right. All right, good job. I know that was hard. Let's go ahead and uh, roll out westbound to Van Nuys. We're clear, right, Jay? We're clear. All right, cover. Good job, Ben. I know that wasn't easy. I've been there before. No, it makes it more difficult. I know. Oh, they made you make the call. Ah. I am. Uh, I never had to do that because I was flying and reporting, so I'd always be like, hey, man, can you make a call? 
Yeah. Good job. Good job, Justin. It was awesome. Yeah, these kind of fun. I like them better when they're done before noon, but uh, oh well.